Welcome in everybody to another episode of Simple Question. It's your boy Scott Proctor alongside my guy Matt Morris per usual. Uh, we're joined by a special guest, a friend of the show, covering the Carolina Panthers for the Charlotte Observer, my guy Ellis Williams. L, thanks for joining us, my man. How we doing? Hey, what's good, y'all? You know I love coming on here. You guys keep it one way, Scotty Band, Mr. <laughs> Matt Morris. Hey, Scott, you're looking fresh with the cut. And Matt, I, I like the Ryder Cup gear, man. You know, we, we, we got some golf love here on the show. I'm here yeah, for it. I was represent. I don't we try to do a little something. We try to do a little something, especially when we got a special guest joining us, man. You you obviously were at Bank of America Stadium for the Browns' 26-24 win over Baker Mayfield and the Panthers on Sunday. You published a story a few hours after that about five things we learned from that game. Go check that on the Charlotte Observer if we haven't already. But let's talk about that. What was your biggest takeaway from the Browns-Panthers week one game um, and really just about the Panthers' opening loss? Obviously, Baker Mayfield's debut. What did you take away from that mostly? A crazy week one, right? Like yeah. this was uh, the very first time I really was in a press box having to do the control alt delete option on anything you write because everything, <laughs> everything I wrote yeah. at halftime, those back to back Miles Garrett sacks uh, on Baker Mayfield that happened halfway through the third quarter, the score was twenty to seven. Miles mm-hmm. Garrett beat Ika McQuanu on back to back plays, a second down play, then a third down play for a strip sack that Baker recovered. I looked over at my beat partner to the left, but my columnist to the left, I said, game's over. This is a wrap. It's over. I've seen Miles Garrett do this before, right? Yeah. So you're typing away, you're typing away. <laughs> then, then Robbie Anderson scores a 75-yard touchdown yeah. on one play that took 11, se- 11 seconds off the clock. Control, alt, delete. Okay, whatever. Start writing again. <laughs> then the Browns go down and score, take 11 minutes off the clock. Yeah. I know I'm, I'm trying to ju- jump as concisely as possible. The Browns scored nine points in the second half. They did so on 15 minutes of gameplay. They took a whole quarter to score nine points. It tells three you field goals. Form. No touchdowns, by the way. Three exactly. field goals. Three field goals. Tells you their formula, right? right. So That's Browns cool. go down and score. I'm like, all right, this is probably over. Carolina goes down and kicks the go-ahead kick with 124 remaining, under 90 seconds, to take their first lead of the game. Now I'm like, okay, is Jacoby Brissett really going to go down there and win this game? So I start typing about how Baker has beat his former team. <laughs> but little did I know that Coach Mike Preef Sr., yes, sir. rookie kicker, drafted in the fourth round for a reason, who trotted out there to kick a game-winning 58-yard bomb that was nothing but net. It would ice have been veins. ice. It would have been good from 70. And I'll end <laughs> with this. The legendary kicker in Cleveland, his name's Phil Dawson. He was the most famous Brown for a while there because the Browns don't have quarterbacks still. <laughs> uh, and um, his career long, Phil Dawson played 13 years in the league, 57. Wow. This rookie wins the game in week one at 58-yard field goal. So I, I know I just h- highlighted the biggest moment, but really my biggest takeaway was just appreciating uh, the number one soap opera in America that is the NFL. Oh, yeah. and-, and we can jump off from there, y'all. And before you go, Matt, I mean, you did a you did a great job encapsulating how crazy that game was because on a weekend full of crazy games, right. that might be the craziest. <laughs> Obviously, the Pittsburgh the Pittsburgh uh, Bengals game was was ridiculous. The Falcons Saints game was ridiculous as well. But this was right up there as well. And what what a welcome to the season. But go ahead, Matt. Great insight into being a beat writer too. Just immediately changing everything, <laughs> having to completely rewrite an article on a deadline. I love that. Uh, but you mentioned Ika Mikwanu. He kind of got baptized in fire going up against Miles Garrett. Overall, the O-line was something that the Panthers needed to address, and they tried to with, you know, with, with Aquanu. How do you think the, the group looks right now, uh, especially going up against a Cleveland Browns team that has a really good pass rush? Yeah, really a mixed result, right? We anticipated going into this game that Ika Mikwanu was going to have his tough beats against Miles Garrett, and I love how you sh- you put that, baptized by fire. That is exactly what happened, right? Yep. And this is a group that needs to earn more reps together to build that cohesiveness that you expect across an offensive line. I'll say this, for the Panthers' offense as a whole, you saw them improve each series, each drive. Uh, the first series of the game, three and out. Christian McCaffrey had three carries at halftime. By the time the game was over, the Panthers had scored 17 second half points. Baker Mayfield, five of six passing for 135 yards in the fourth quarter alone. What we saw was the Panthers offense 
slowly but surely figure it out with each possession. And I know mathematically it wasn't going to happen, but if that's a game that goes into overtime, I like where the Panthers offense was going with their momentum. And that starts up front. So what I'm trying to say is they started to find some inside runs, some inside RPOs that were being blocked. Well, Uh, left guard, Brady Christensen, who's a second year guy, a center that they're still trying to figure out in Pat Elfline. Um, And then Austin Corbett or their free agent uh, guard, they signed from the Rams who also started his career in Cleveland. So it was a slow start. That was the first thing Matt Rule said when he went to the podium. Yeah, a, a, a start they clearly could not overcome, even though they came dang close. But I now expect the Browns to carry that momentum into week two with the Giants. And if they don't, then we'll be having a very different conversation next time we link up, y'all. <laughs> no doubt about it. Obviously, the Panthers, particularly offensively, they kind of go as Christian McCaffrey goes. Um, but right. obviously, CMC's workload, uh, I saw somebody put it this way, was very un-CMC-like on Sunday. That was his lowest touch total in a game that he didn't leave injured since 2018 so i think that says a lot why do you think that is and do you think that's going to be more of a the norm or more of an outlier as we move forward to the season here i anticipate it being an outlier we will talk to the coordinators on thursday and i'm sure ben mcadoo the new offensive coordinator here in carolina will be getting a lot of questions about that i am empathetic to the reasoning for Christian's la- lack of touches, according to Matt Rule, according to Christian McCaffrey himself, them both saying, paraphrasing, but essentially saying, it's tough to rush the football or generate any sort of game script when you're going three and out. Yeah, yep. that's, right. And that's really how the first half started. I, you know, I said the first series is three and out, three straight passing attempts, by the way, and out. And then the second series, I think they have five plays and out. And then they don't get their first first down until the third series, which came via a roughing the passer. So you can see that this offense, again, as I in my last answer, was just stagnant. They were slow and didn't really figure anything out till the second half when you're playing catch up. And then, you know, rushing Christian McCaffrey doesn't fit game script anyway. I expect a heavy dose of CMC going into this week two Giants game. And like I ended the last answer, if that isn't the case, then we'll have a very different conversation once again. No doubt. Yeah, so you don't think it was anything as far as like trying to limit and his workload as far as the health issues? Because obviously last year when he was out, the whole season just went completely around. Right, right. So so I can answer that in, in two ways. First one being right after the game, Matt Rule said, we are not managing Christian McCaffrey. All right. If you want to take his word for it, that's cool. If you want to peel it back a, a little de- to get a little deeper and just play some game theory here. It would make sense to condition Christian so that he has fresh legs into the fourth quarter. If you believe you're going to be in all these games late, which this game was a Vegas pick them, right? So, you know, Vegas thinks this is going to be a close game and it ended up being a close game and Christian looked great in the fourth quarter. So though it, that wasn't how they wanted to execute it, the, the end result is a fresh Christian McCaffrey in the fourth quarter. So I don't think they're as worried about Christian getting injured as they are just about keeping him fresh in the fourth quarter. So I could see the formula going forward being, you know, make sure Christian has between 10 and 14 touches. So that could be receptions or rushing attempts, obviously 12 to 14 of those in the first half. And then let's unleash him in the fourth quarter and go win some football games. Cause that's what it comes down to in this league, right? Having the ball. Absolutely. And and going off of that a little bit, like I said, last year, Darnold was not good enough to kind of once McCaffrey was gone and the 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 emphasis was on him and defenses were focusing on him. It kind of fell apart. What did you take from Baker Mayfield start and how do you feel his tenure as the Panthers quarterback is going to go and how it might be different than what we saw last year from like Darnold? Right. Um, I think I can encapsulate this in a simple uh texting conversation I had with a friend who's been a Baker Mayfield fan before I even started covering the Browns, right? This was an old roommate of mine. I was doing high school sports out in upstate New York. So shout out Garrett. If, if somehow you find this, this man's been an OG Baker fan from the jump. He texted me after uh, this Panthers Browns game. We were talking about the Robbie Anderson touchdown, one pass attempt, 75 yard, beautiful ball. And Garrett texted me, Darnold could never. <laughs> That's a fact. Right? He's not wrong. Right. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. No. Not only could Darnold never, he would never. His eyes just wouldn't be downfield looking for that ball, looking for that chance, looking for that explosion. 
And then the football, the throw itself, right? So it starts with the eyes. I'm, I'm talking to Scott Proctor about quarterback play here, right? How funny is that? <laughs> <laughs> it, starts, right? it starts with the eyes. You, you're keeping your eyes downfield, trying to keep the play alive, moving about the pocket. That was a, a, a crafty maneuver by Baker. And then the ball's on the money. So I know this doesn't all come down to one throw, but I really do think that ball encapsulated everything Baker Mayfield's going to bring to this Carolina team. And then on top of that, you had this rushing touchdown, which you know Sam can do too, but it's about the celebration in the end zone. He <laughs> corked that ball about 110 miles per hour with no regard for human life. And whoever was getting in front of that. He Could does have that like swag out with that one. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's the Baker Mayfield experience. There's going to be highs. It's going to be lows, but he is going to keep this team competitive and i think that's what panther fans found out on sunday yeah i think i think sunday's performance was exactly what we're get, gonna get from baker for most of the season right. like he's gonna deliver the splash plays he's gonna he's gonna be tough as nails he's gonna yep. extend plays and put his body on the line but there will be sacks there will be fumbles there will be turnovers but um i think obviously they're in a much better position quarterback wise than they were last year with darnold um mm-hmm. i want to switch gears just a little bit not really though i'm going to stay on this side of the ball um in terms of who you think the Panthers offensive player is who needs to step up outside of Christian McCaffrey, outside of Baker, obviously. We mentioned Robbie Anderson, who, who had a, a pretty good you know, week one. Obviously, most of his yardage came on that 75-yard touchdown. DJ Moore was highly touted coming into this season. He had a kind of a, a slow start in week one. Um, is it one of those two guys, somebody else that um, really needs to step up for the Panthers offensively here this season moving forward? Yeah, you know, before that DJ reception, I would have said it was it was DJ Moore. But as they started figuring out their offensive identity and what they wanted to do, they're going to have some chances to run these inside hitting RPOs and find DJ breaking in on a deep 15 yard in cut, exploiting a one on one matchup. So I am confident DJ is going to be just fine. The player who needs to step up is actually an entire room, Scott Proctor. This tight end room, I'm really concerned about. Ian Thomas did have, I don't know, maybe two catches for 65 yards or something like that. I think he was the second leading receiver behind uh, Robbie, yeah. There you go. But that one reception came, excuse me, 50 of those yards came on one reception, a completely blown coverage by the Browns where Thomas just ran down the seam and Baker hit him in stride. And y'all, I, I kid you not, we, everyone in the media, in the press box was holding their breath because it was one of those, oh my gosh, he's going to drop it. He's going to drop it moments because he, Baker let him. And then he, Ian has such long strides and such giant thighs where we just envision the ball being brought down to his hip and his thigh board just knocking it out. Right. Yes. We, yeah. You've seen. Definitely. We don't want to call these NFL players unathletic, but in ter- in relative to who <laughs> the other tight ends are, they call right, it. Right. It, it was a little naffy. So a little naffy. I was waiting on you to drop it. Naffy. They don't know if you know, you know. They don't know. They don't know. But now they do. <laughs> Google, Google is a wonderful wizard. Um, the point being, it shouldn't be that hard for your tight end to be that wide open and you still need everything to go to come together perfectly. Yeah. On top of that, Baker Mayfield made his bread and butter off hitting his tight ends in Cleveland. David Njoku was the leading receiver for the Browns last year. I'm not sure whether it's Ian Thomas or second year tight end Tommy Tremble out of Notre Dame, who they were high on, who it's going to be, but this team needs to find a tight end eventually because in those got to have it moments, that's just where Baker naturally wants to go. And I'm, I don't know if they have that guy right now. That's facts. And that's a good point. I, I was going to bring it up, but obviously you got to it first. I mean, that was a big part of what made Baker successful in Cleveland. I mean, multiple tight end sets with Njoku, with Hooper, with Harrison Bryant, who they drafted recently as well. Um, in terms of a security blanket, that's something that Baker needs at the tight end position. And my last question we got Wilson for you. Back. Go ahead. What'd you say, Matt? I said they might have to call Greg Olson back. <laughs> oh, <laughs> from the booth, he might just come on down. You never yeah, know. He not, yeah, he's not doing that. But uh, that's not a bad <laughs> idea, though. That's not a bad idea. Oh, last question we got for you before we let you get up out of here, man. Um, I know that you're a Hastings, Minnesota native, loud and proud man. What do you think about the NFC North through week one? Obviously, the Vikings had a huge dominating home win over the Packers, man. My Bears got a nice home win over the Niners Absolutely. in the monsoon. What are you making of the NFC North after one week, man? It's been juicy. Oh, juicy and spicy and hot. This is going to be a 
fun division. I mean, first of all, shout out Jet, Justin Jefferson. The gritty is alive, never been better. Ooh, throw them bees up. <laughs> um, this young man is clearly the coldest receiver in football. Some of these releases uh, are just Antonio Brown inside the frame of Randy Moss. It, 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 right? It's scary. It's very, very scary, like the things we see in movies. Let me tell you, this <laughs> offense... They're going to figure out their red zone stuff. Dalvin Cook is about to be, be much more involved and close. And they didn't need to play with that urgency because Green Bay's offense never got it going. And this is not me coming on here to to bash Green Bay and, and, and can them and bury them. The same thing happened a year ago when they were waxed by the Saints, I think. And, you know, they end up 13-3 and in the NFC Championship. They're going to be fine. Uh, I feel bad for Christian Watson. That That's a that's a, that's a a play. You, you, it's tough. You, Tough. It's tough. tough to come back for that. Everybody, you're not going. You're not going to forget that if you're a Packer fan, unless he really turns it around quickly here. Exactly. It's about as tough as it gets. Uh, those running backs, Aaron Jones, AJ Dillon, they better stay healthy all year because I don't know where else it's going to come from. Backs. Mm-hmm. Detroit looks spicy, like you said. I mean, Detroit, we can't yeah. sit on the Lions. I guess. I mean, DeAndre Swift looks like he's that dude. I didn't watch Hard Knocks because we we do enough of this for a living. I don't need more. <laughs> home. Unplug some. And then. Right, and then Scotty Bands, your Bears, bro. What do you think hey, about your Bears? I need to hear it from you. Hey, man, I uh, I was just telling a couple of homies, man. I I'm as pleased as I can be, you know, from yeah. given the circumstances, given that they played a team who I have high expectations for. Even with Trey Lance, I'm talking about the 49ers. I expect right. the 49ers to be a double digit win team and go deep into the playoffs. Um, obviously the, the weather played a factor in it, but both teams had to play in that. Justin Fields is, you know, making a second or his first start in his second season. Um, you know, he made plays. It looked ugly for the first half, but you know, this defense, um, <laughs> some of the guy, the rookies, the secondary, Jaquan yeah. Brisker, um, yeah, obviously Dominique great. Robinson, somebody that got in the fifth round who had, a, I think a sack and a half was disruptive yeah. on the defensive line. So, um, I'm excited, man. Again, it was, it was an ugly win, but it was a win that not a lot of people expected. And obviously, Sunday night brings a very intriguing matchup in Lambeau with the Bears and Packers. So it, it can get really spicy if the Bears can find a way to get that one. It'll be really interesting. I am pessimistically optimistic about this Bears team. I have some hope, but they, they know how to just ruin that real quick. So I don't know how to feel yet. Right. And, and then we get Vikings Eagles Monday night. So this is this NFC great game. North, game, right? This NFC North primetime run yeah. we're about to get to this week is going to be literally prime time. So let's enjoy it, y'all. And and I just it's great when the NFC North gives us something to talk about. Agreed, man. And Always last is. thing, these two guys know. I was very high on the Vikings coming into this season. I, I pegged them as a 12-13 win team. I thought they were going to win the division even before Week One. Week One kind of solidified that for me. But yeah, you mentioned it. Justin Jefferson. It's not going to get much more. Um, he had probably his toughest test he's going to see for a while in Jair Alexander in week one. Right. It's going to get a lot matter. easier moving forward. So it didn't matter. It it just didn't matter. It just Watch didn't out. matter, man. But but this has been great, L. Will, man. Thanks again so much for joining us. Go check out L's work on Twitter and at the Charlotte Observer. But that's going to do it for us, man. Your boy, Scott Proctor, Matt Morris, Ellis Williams. We'll catch you on the next episode of Simple Questions. Thanks for watching. Feel free to check out our other videos and don't forget to smack that subscribe button down below while you're at it. Also, for more great and original content, head right over to bbmsports.com.